Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee, and we have with us Squid Bikes Ivy Audrain. Hi, John. How's it going? <laughs> going great, Ivy. And Nate, our CEO, Nate Pearson. It's just the three Hi. amigos today. And so everyone should know that when these when we're late, it's like almost always me. Um, <laughs> was, it's the panic. Uh, my kids were here this morning. I was dropping off at a summer camp, and I my alarm like you know you set the alarm and you check it and then it doesn't go off or yes. you did it wrong. I did yes. that, and then my daughter also forgot to set her alarm, so she wakes me up. We run. That's usually the worst because when as a parent, if you get more, just as a boss too, if you get super anxious, everyone else is like, "Ah, oh, I'm so bad." We were calm yeah. and smooth. Then we come back. I'm here four minutes early. And then my microphone, what you guys said, it sounded like a robot or something. <laughs> no, like a Teletubby. <laughs> a Teletubby. And it you was know, amazing. <laughs> my mistake was uh, last night I was like, oh, there's a new version of uh, Mac OS. I should just update that. That's been a while. Oh, there um, it goes. <laughs> right? And uh, so I had to switch mics. And this is my travel mic. So if I sound a little bit different, I'm sorry. But it's probably, it'll be a good one still, right? Because I have all this adrenaline inside of me. And I'm sorry for the interruptions. Oh, already. that's great. We, our first question is going to be fantastic then, Nate. Keep the adrenaline. And we're going to talk about what you change about pro cycling or racing in general. So that, that'll be a good oh one. I bet you'll have lots of ideas. Um, before, we do, <laughs> before you do that, though, I want to mention the fact that within the next, uh, geez, 48 hours or so, you're going to have a new Cycling Science Explained video where I go deep into a topic that, hmm, let me review here in my mind, that will give you similar gains than what you get for endurance training. And I'm trying to, you know, tightly quote what we see from the studies that we're talking about similar gains it, for endurance training with 10% of the work. Is it doping? <laughs> it's not doping. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It is legal. Wouldn't that be crazy Fair if we released question. a video and it was just like how to do it? Like <laughs> how, to not, how to not get caught, how the pros do it. Like, oh my gosh, yeah. we, we wouldn't do that. Nate, have you watched any of the tour de France? You're not typically a bike race watcher. No, I watch them every year, but well, not every year, but I watched the last like three years, but not this year so far. And I know we have yeah. the fantasy and I, I messed up for the fantasy uh, league, but it's tough. Yeah, I haven't been it's doing always it. on during work and yes. it's like, especially during the <laughs> yeah. podcast live. So no, no live spoilers for everybody. Yeah, for sure. It's uh today's, uh, we won't talk about today's stage, but it's certainly been like, uh, it's been a lot of extraordinary performances that we've seen. Like it's crazy. So it's, it's a, it's an interesting tour. The nice part um, is if you can like avoid spoilers, you can watch it after the fact and it's just as exciting. It's like a totally. binge watching a series, right? Uh, yeah. It's really hard, especially at trainer road to avoid spoilers. We have a spoiler channel and okay, here's yeah. my pet peeve. Um, sorry, I always go off track. There's only three of us. So I, I'm going to talk a lot. My pet <laughs> peeve is when, you know, you see a movie and people go, uh, you know, there's, there's a huge twist at the end. They're like, oh, yeah. I'm like, that's a spoiler. And they're like, yeah. no, I didn't tell you what it is. So if someone goes, oh my God, that finish is crazy. Yeah. Like, then you know something's going to happen. You know it's going to be a group finish. You know it's not going to be a solo breakaway. The, the person who goes, like, you're like, okay, I can just ignore all this stuff or anything like that. Just say, the stage happened. Yeah, um, exactly. And, it occurred. There was a stage. <laughs> there was a, there was a scheduled occurred. stage. No, you don't say it occurred. Because sometimes, like, crazy stuff happens, right? Uh, Spoiler. Like, uh, the, the 1K thing, like, deflates and, like, everything, happens, you know. Yeah, so, bus anyway. goes into the into the finished gantry, something like so that. It's July 7th. That's what you say. And then that's mm -hmm. it. And then afterwards, you ask for permission, <laughs> then you talk about it. That's, that's yeah. the way to do it. Seems yeah. fair. Ivy, have you watched any of it? <clears throat> Uh, no, I was just thinking how depressing it is that between work and training and trying to be healthy and normal, I have like six to eight minutes before I go to sleep that I <laughs> yeah, <laughs> watch something or consume, you know, videos or TikTok or whatever. And it's usually not the tour. Understandably. Yes. Yeah. Understandably. I, I, sure. I watch, <laughs> I'm the worst mm -hmm. tour watcher because I do it during my morning runs, which I run early in the morning on the treadmill and I have a TV there and I watch it. So I watch like the spot that nobody watches. I'll make the inverse. Now people usually watch the beginning and then watch like the final 20 K I watch like from 140 K to like 100 K to go and, and absolutely nothing happens and it's completely boring, but you know, that's just what I got time for. So they should just let us do a podcast during that time. 
just right in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The no man's land podcast. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah for sure. Uh, Tahoe trail 100 for everybody listening to this, that is in the Tahoe area. Even if you aren't doing the race, uh, Sacramento area, all the way over to Reno, Tahoe, wherever, uh, Bay area. If you want to join Ivy and I, it's going to be tomorrow, 9am at the gondola at North star, tomorrow. the same gondola. That, uh, yeah. It's Friday. Yeah. Friday. Yep. Oh, no, no, wow. not the race. We're doing a pre-ride tomorrow. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> course pre-ride. So that's tomorrow. That's going to be Friday, July 8th. And we are going to be meeting at 9am at the gondola. If you want to pre-ride a lap of the course, it's going to be a cruisy pace. Derek Teal from lap. Dialed Health is coming. Just one lap. No two laps. Yeah. <laughs> One's enough. <laughs> yeah. Mm. It's going to be good times. It's going to be a lot of fun. By the way, Derek mm. from Dialed Health did not ha- does not have a TikTok. Like, I know. It's kind of he, crazy. He's huh? blown up. He, you just post it on there. Like any content creators, TikTok is the platform that is the most likely for you to blow up and get lots of followers. So and Instagram is extremely hard right now. Uh, the new real system is better, but the fact that he was able to grow on Instagram means he has amazing content that he should put on TikTok and it'll be like 300,000 people in like a month. It, it's crazy. Yeah, it's true. My neck hurts just watching some of those videos though. Like, He's a handsome dude and always does lifts without a shirt on too. So there's something behind that, I think. <laughs> I just showed so, somebody. It was a woman. I was like, oh, look at this. And they went, ooh. Like. <laughs> <laughs> He's married with three kids. Step away. Um, uh, so this uh, this weekend is also the Crusher and the Tusher. And I want to wish a good luck to everybody doing that event. I'm sure we have plenty of athletes listening to this podcast that are doing it. As well as, of course, Hannah, Alex Wild, Keegan, Sophia, the regulars that you know on this podcast as well. Hi, guy. Yeah, and Ryan Standish. It's gonna be awesome. <laughs> he he just released a denim vest, by the way, with hyper threads. It's like a cycling vest, but it looks like denim and it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is so go check a, it out. That's a gravel like like icon. That's so cool. Oh yeah. Yeah. Ryan's doing smart stuff. So okay, <laughs> with all that said, I hope you join Ivy and I tomorrow. We haven't Ivy, I, I have done a bad job of marketing this. So we need to like push it on our channels today and make sure that people know about it. Uh, it, it'll probably be like two, two and a half hours. We'll be recollecting regularly, by the way, it will not be crazy pace. It will be chill pace. It's going to be a good time. So anybody that wants to join, we'd love to have you there. You can also just reach out to us if you have any questions on Instagram and we'll, uh, we'll see it. So Liam says, I must be missing something obvious here. I was thinking this when watching the XCO world cup a couple of weeks ago. And again, watching the tour de France this week. Why don't riders have their names on their jerseys like they do in football, soccer, etc.? A great way to increase interest in a sport is to make it easier to watch. And I keep seeing overhead replays with arrows picking out one rider, and it seems crazy to me. Not only would it make sense or make it easier to watch, but for kids or, or but kids and adults could even go out and get their favorite rider's jersey like they do for other sports. Why do we persist with meaningless for the viewers numbers pinned to shirts? Keep up the great work. Uh, Nate, I know you have a lot to add, so I want to bottle you up and keep you in terms of like the things that you would change about cycling and racing. Good luck. <laughs> Ivy, what, what thoughts do you have either on this matter or other matters in general? Oh, well, I mean, just on the numbers on Jersey and having your name on your Jersey. I love this. This is something that squid bikes has done for their pro riders for years. And so my kit this year was designed in house with my nickname and a moto style number on the back of my kit. So even if there's not field compliance and not everyone is doing that, um, I think that squid and myself think it helps folks feel like they can better identify the riders and recognize us at races. So we do that. That's awesome. I like that. That's a good approach. More, more people should do it. You see it sometimes in downhill. There are a couple riders that put their number on there. But the frustrating thing is UCI still makes them pin numbers over the top of it. Uh, I just don't understand the pinning numbers thing. It's just, and there, it's there like, are some UCI rules about, uh, uniformity between writers jerseys. And I think there may, might be UCI rules about, um, yeah, this is totally true. Like, uh, you have to submit a design to the UCI and if your kit or branding deviates from that, either through the season or between writers, you get fined from the UCI. So there are like active roadblocks against it. People should have numbers. Like this is my number on the team, just like other yeah. sports and you carry it through. Like if there's a number eight on one team on basketball, another eight, on another team, they understand that they're not the same person. Like yeah, who's number 23, who's 23 in basketball, Michael right? Jordan. Exactly. For the ages, like everyone knows that it's such a powerful thing to have that brand there. And 
when people can fall in love with an athlete and then like identify with that athlete and have kit that identifies with that athlete, it just raises that sport entirely. Like it's, it's all positive for it. I feel like this is a situation where, and we talk about this from a product and like as a business, a lot of the time where we'll build features, but we won't think of them purely from marketers perspectives or users perspectives. And instead we think of it from an engineer's perspective and we have to make a, a concerted effort to think of it from the customer's perspective instead of just engineer's perspective. And this is like on the racing side, this totally seems like thinking of it from a race organizer's perspective. I need to have numbers and I need to have everything be the same, but you know, those numbers are going to identify with the sheet that I have. That's, and that's going to say it, why not just give people a career number, let them pick it and then let them use it throughout the, throughout the whole year. And Season. they have transponders too, right? Like, so they're not yeah. even writing down these people's numbers. And when they do the camera thing for the finish, they know like the difference between, uh, top writers when they look at them, it's. Why? Maybe it's a, maybe it's like a big thing for like a big safety pin. Maybe there's like a, a big uh -huh. industry behind this because also, <laughs> uh, I don't know if you noticed, yeah, <laughs> Ineos started running, um, kind of like a, I think they use bio racer kit and bio racer is a company that uses like either a mesh sheet or like a clear plastic sheet to put your numbers inside. So then you don't have to poke holes into your really expensive kit all the time. And it's a great idea but apparently the UCI is telling them they can't use those anymore and they have to go back to using safety pins. It's just for like for us regular folks. If you don't like pinning your kits and poking a bunch of holes in them, I use TNR tape. It's like great adhesive number tape and works super well. As long as you put it on dry kit, if you try to do like a big warm up and you're super wet and sticky, it might not stick great, but I love that. No more pins in kit. 3M 77 spray. Good yep. way to like, Works well too. That leaves like a residue, it's right? Forever. But your number is <laughs> nice and flat <laughs> and really good. And no one, I mean, we all look, no, whose kit is very, uh, okay, who here, you're both going to say yes, who here looks at people's kits and judge them for like little imperfections and dirtiness and stuff like that? I mean, I mean, yes, but then I tell that voice to go away. So, yes. imperfections, <laughs> no, dirtiness. Absolutely. Get your, get your stuff yeah. together. <laughs> John, I feel yeah. like you have a career in like fashion marketing someday if you want to. Oh, uh, like, yeah. Like yeah. That could be a, you'd be really good at that. Um, I, I, I did used to manage a Kenneth Cole store. So, I mean, there, there we go. go. That was a college like, job. You've so. got a pretty good resume between that and <laughs> training <Trina Rose. laughs> There we go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Can I talk about some other things and can we just generally talk about some things we'd want to change about racing? And please, someone, people in the chat first upvote us, but like, let us know. And I will say those things that you're saying, uh, a hundred percent and give us yeah. a thumbs up when Nate says up, upvote. That's what he means. So, oh. uh, you can join us every Thursday, at 8am Pacific, and we would love to have you in the live chat. So before let you us go know on, what, John, I, I yeah. want to talk about the, the, the pockets too, for those yeah. pockets, the clear plastic ones, my gosh, those can get really, really hot. So hot when you're racing. <laughs> I would stay away from the plastic ones. Like John, like we would see each other too. Cause that was our 40 K TT kits. You could see the sweat, but like coming through there, it's like a little greenhouse. And then we got some with, um, or at least I got one with the, uh, it was an illegal kit. I couldn't reuse it. Um, with the mesh, the mesh is yeah. great. It's like super mm -hmm. light. I mean, not that the weight really matters in this case anyways, cause it's a couple grams, but it it's breathable and it's, it's very nice to do that. So that's yeah. what I recommend. I agree. Cause your lower back too is like a spot where you tend to like collect or invent a lot of heat. You know, it's like sun's usually on it. And mm -hmm. if you watch, uh, all the cross country racers, like, you know, Evie Richards and stuff, when she's going through and she grabs a bottle, that's just to pour on herself and cool off in a race. Or if you watch cyclocross, you'll see this in a hot race. A lot of times they'll pour it onto their body and they'll pour onto their lower back really commonly just cause it really helps cool you off. So that's a bad spot to have something that doesn't breathe and collects a lot of heat from the sun. Um, okay. So if you're in the chat right now, let us know what you would want to change about cycling and Nate will chime in and say them. I've got some ideas. Uh, I would love to have more focus on team classifications at big races and unique points awarded for different rider roles. Like, um, you should get points as a domestique appropriately, like in, in basketball, for example, a point guard may score points, something else. They have like a universal versal system, which is a point scored. And that's great. And in cycling, we don't really have anything close to that, but at the very least, it would be great to have at least like, yeah, you know, in this week, 
Sepp Kuss did a fantastic job at being a domestique. And as a result, he was racking up points in that role. Or somebody did a great job on the time trial for that team. Maybe they didn't win, but they did a great job. And as a result, they got more points. I would just, I would like to see that. I think it could make things more interesting and celebrate more well, riders. At least stats, right? Because like in basketball, we have like the assist stat. And then, so you know that somebody helps somebody else out. In cycling, like it's really hard to tell if a domestique did a good job, unless it's, you know, like uh, on a climb or something that's a 4% climb and they're pulling it the whole peloton. Yeah. Yeah. Ivy, do you have any ideas before I jump into a whole list of them that you'd like to change? Yes, I agree. <laughs> cool, yeah. John, can I'd I also, jump in and just like tell please? you what a good, like, do, no, as you're saying them, I'm going to like be like, yeah. you're absolutely right. Be and my hype like, man. I love that. We will, uh, <laughs> it feels cathartic, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Like this grind my gear section. Yes. I would love to have a public facing draft system in road racing with something like a combine. So like, Ooh. it would be cool to be able to like benchmark people because what if that domestique that never gets honored actually has like absolutely insane five minute power. And that could be something that's really interesting. And then causes a lot of athletes to identify with them a really good, like our power. And then as a result, they buy their jerseys and they go out. I mean, we have the keys here. We can change the whole sport, but this would be a great, like, I think this would be fun. And think of the marketing too, of like, uh, like having that combine day and different things like that. Uh, other companies totally. too would, I mean, that'd be a huge marketing thing and the excitement of who's going to go where, what's going to happen, even just awesome. with power and stuff and the different skills, cornering, who can corner this one the best, right? Like who yeah. can do this? Uh, even like simple would... skills things, right? Ivy, like it'd be cool to have like a, like the skills courses that we put like the junior mountain bikers through, like see if somebody's just insane with bike skill. Make the road yeah. racers do a dual solemn on their road bikes, yeah. but on the road, like, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> max rpm right like uh anything eating, like that eating contest who can yes. have the most carbs per hour like who can carry exactly. the most bottles like, in their jersey who can average the most the mo yeah who can average the most carbs over six hours and like not throw up and keep a yes. sustained power that would be yeah. actually if they they could cut it up i would watch that just to see some of the, like, 400 <laughs> heck yeah Totally. I think it'd be interesting. It'd be cool to see. I'd also like to have like more format changes. Uh, I'm thinking of the Red Bull Bay climb, how it was like this, like bracketed one-on-one -on -one thing. And before we go, ah, that would take too long. We do time trials where riders go off one by one and it takes hours upon hours and it's the same exact thing. So we already tune into that. I know that some of you are probably saying you never watch a time trial. It'd be a whole lot more interesting if we could do two by two instead of one by two, one by one. And then have them face off on like a short, steep climb. Uh, I think that that could be interesting to see doing that. And maybe you don't do something like time on those stages. You just do points. I don't know, but I think that that could be awesome. And, and the hammer series, I know tried a lot of these different things and I don't know why the hammer series didn't succeed. If it was viewership or if it was just funding or what happened. But if we look at other sports, you have basketball with like the, the dunk competitions that they have baseball with the home run derby competitions. We have all that stuff and that brings in a lot of people into the sport. I remember watching like Jose Canseco when I was a kid and Mark McGuire and like those guys hitting just crazy home runs. And that I don't play baseball, but that absolutely was the most interesting thing about baseball to me, you know? Yeah, so a couple of, uh, comments in the chat, Matt Lawrence says, Jonathan is advocating for the Hogwarts system of scoring. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> and another one based on what other people said is a sprint competition for solo though you start mm -hmm. here you people ride into a certain amount and each rider gets to say how fast they can cover a certain distance independently wouldn't that be fun to watch and you see their power live and like we could make sure it's all calibrated uh that'd be yes. so cool to say like what's their peak how does it average and i could see this like espn thing where like their power curves change and they talk about we the can show that up like, on screen during the race yeah. and like they talk about like oh. f1 like f1 would do this sort of thing right like this is what yeah this is and here and here's at these points where they changed and this person you know a longer one versus a shorter one one could be a really you know you have to be below this speed before you hit this point and then what's yes. your how fast you cross it like a pop versus sustained that would be so fun to watch the top people so much I, fun i would love it yeah. Um, I think there should be a union that supports pro cyclists with better base salaries. I know there is a base salary, but better base salaries and then salary caps on teams with weighted contributions to level the playing fields. So this is something that happens in MLS or like major league soccer. And I'm sure plenty of other leagues that I don't understand, but at least in major league soccer, I'll use that as an example because I'm familiar with it. They have salary caps and then they have allocations. And depending on 
your team's budget, success, um, everything else, those get changed around to make sure that parity exists within the league. And that does help quite a lot. It isn't something where it like bankrupts the team and then makes them just like crazy, you know, you know, war bucks the next year or something like that. But it's just, it makes it so that it's much more balanced. I think that could be really helpful. And you know? the reason too, that is possible is because they, I think this isn't a, okay. I don't know my sports stuff very well of, of, of um, how it gets funded, but usually it's the viewership, like the TV rights get, it gets spread across. Right. And mm -hmm. I think even maybe merchandising, I'm not sure about that. Actually, I think that's maybe per team, but they spread it across where everyone gets the money and that makes it all better because if it's competitive, everyone wants to watch more. If yes. just one team has all the money and they always win, it's not as fun. Just like a tour de France. When, when one team is so dominant, those are the worst tour de France's when everyone, yes. like what John's talking about, if there's a draft system, money's pretty close. That's amazing. And you can, if you have a higher base salary, um, especially for the lower levels, more mm -hmm. people will, will do that sport and more, more people will come into it and it gets more competitive and more uh, crazy and fun to watch. It's like things sure. you can put in place to make everybody more money and everyone likes to watch it more too. And there's proof that it works. There's also proof that it's expensive, I'm sure, but it's also profitable eventually and it does work. Like So I look at what we see with all a bunch of different sports across the board. These next ones are more personal gripes rather than like changing the sport in general, but less man-made features in cross country racing and more real technical features. <clears throat> the thing about a man-made feature is there's always a solution. It's engineered to have a solution and that solution will be found. And as a result, that rock garden that looks like intimidating, it's everyone does the same exact line. There's no option to choose. And it's just like straightforward. It's like a conga line through there instead of actually something that introduces choice. And if you look at technical features, like just um, hmm, uh, a few weeks ago, they had the race in Leogang, Austria, and it just had this really raw descent, a couple of them. And they weren't crazy, you know, difficult, dangerous or anything else like that. It was just natural, rooty, raw, and they taped it wide. And as a result, you'd see riders taking any one of three lines every time. And it really made it interesting because since riders could take three different lines, they all thought that this is my chance to get by somebody. So it was always a point of real interest rather than just watching them tiptoe down a man-made rock garden. I think they're boring. Ivy, I don't know if you have any feeling on this because cyclocross in the U S maybe has a bit of man-made stuff, but not too often. Um, a little bit of man-made stuff, but, uh, there are more, I think features with cross that make you kind of have to choose your line and that present opportunities opportunities to make racing happen in those key moments based upon your line, line choice and how you ride it that make it a little more exciting. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'd also like to see a global XC series with more variety than just 90 minute world cups. I know they have short track right now, but it'd be great if one week was like a marathon race. One week was a short track race. One week was a cross country Olympic race. I would like to see that because I think it would make it so that there's less dominance, uh, by specific riders. Another thing, and I know Nate will feel passionate about this one too, but I want to normalize better head protection in the sport of cycling, like more surface area protection, less focus on weight. And I feel like every brand now is like, they just slap MIPS onto the helmet and they're like, Hey, it's safe. Like, here you go. It's got MIPS. It's safe. And let's be real. Like a, a slip plane and a bicycle helmet. When you fall, your bicycle helmet drifts on your head anyway. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not like it's locked in like a race car helmet, motorcycle helmet, where it's truly like squeezing your entire head and it thusly if it moves it moves your head on a bicycle helmet in almost every single case it can still drift around when it hits and mips helps that for sure all these different things but it's not like that is what you need to make a helmet safe and that's just like yeah okay it's fine there should be more true innovation on that there's some helmets that they've done uh, that they've made in the motorsports industry that have really cool like really cool innovative tech to try to help them be safer 6d is the company I know they make a mountain bike helmet too, with like similar tech in it, but we just, all the helmets, I mean, the helmets that are just released this year, I just look at them and it seems like it's less and less protection in terms of surface area on your head. Imagine if the NFL was like this year, our helmets are hundred grams lighter. Like just kept, <laughs> like that was the innovation, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, anyway, exactly. It would not be, uh, they, so many cyclists too, in these big races tours crash like mm -hmm. every single day. This isn't something that's like. Oh, maybe one time it's, it's needed all the time and people get yeah. concussions. And luckily we, uh, there's not, you know, lots of death in pro cycling, 
but that also does happen and it would set in such a good be such a good leadership position for all of cycling for the pros to say yes it's important to have great protection for your brain and we're going to show that we're it's cool to ride at this level and do these things mm-hmm. and have this on like back in the back in the day too remember when cyclists would not wear helmets on climbs yeah they'd right? take them off yeah i'm sure you you'd see people doing that um i wasn't riding back then but i'm i would knowing human nature i bet you kids would start a climb take their helmet off be like i gotta be cool like lance you know have lots of air flowing over my head that's the way to climb put it on their handlebars and do the climb uh and you might argue you're never going to crash but i've crashed on an uphill climb i was out of the saddle putting weight down and my chain slipped and i flipped over the handlebars uh, yeah, that was happens. going up Geiger. Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah. It, I think I shifted from the little to the big, and that's yeah. What, yeah. Then it slipped, and it can happen. But that's yeah. me, and everyone's like, "Of course, that's you, Nate." But it's there's more. There's lots of Nates out there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. The last one is going to be controversial. Uh, people are probably going to flame me for this, <laughs> but I, I think we should. I think people should be racing e-bikes instead of normal bikes. And you should have a limited use system in some categories, similar to what F1 has with DRS, where you have like the ability to either improve aerodynamics or increase boost for a short period of time. And then it's limited in terms of when you can use that. You can't like, uh, you can only use it for a short period of time. And within a certain period of time, you can only use it X amount of times, right. Or whatever it might be. I, cause I think that we'll all end up on e-bikes in, in some way or another, like there will be like pedal assist involved in all of it. And I think it'd be really cool to just already start working on bringing it in my two cents on it. That is, that is a controversial hot take, John. <laughs> <laughs> let's just make Yikes. it moto racing. Like, let's just put, like, that's what you're asking. Let's hold on here. Let's hold on. We're saying you just have moto racing, have these boosts. Oh, which they, they do in like, uh, in certain sports, they do have them for sure. Um, what if we all gave everyone basketballs and hoops? to shoot into on the bikes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, sure. That does exist. I've seen the soccer uh, where, where they do that. So I see some other ones. A lot of people have uh, different ideas. Um, some of them mentions the fact that like triathlon have disciplines balanced by time to find the real best all around athlete. So John, it is, yeah. Go ahead. Those motors, apparently yeah. that's already been done a little bit in pro cycling where people have motors in their no bikes. No way. With, with boost. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure they're limiting their usage. Yeah. They're yeah. just innovators. They're like yeah, that's seeing it. if it would be interesting to watch. Yeah. Oh man. I'm already firing people up in, in the, in the live chat, but Hey, I'm just saying it could be uh, I think that that's the future. I think we'll all be on e-bikes in some way or another. And I think that the way that to implement it is to have it like at least in pro racing and stuff, have it controlled so that it's only like a short period of time that you can use it. Cause that could also be really interesting. What if it actually was advantageous for you, Nate, not to use it on a climb, but instead use it on a section where it's like a downhill or a flat, because just circumstantially, that's the time to use it. Once again, from a viewership perspective, that's really interesting. And even from like a competitor perspective, because if somebody uses it at one point, I totally could change up the strategy of a race and make it so that because there's usually this constant of energy is, is finite and limited. And this suddenly shifts that just temporarily for a short period of time. I think you'd make it interesting. Okay. Hear me out. Mm. Paintball oh boy. guns. <laughs> Get out of here. It <laughs> <laughs> would be interesting. Just kidding. Okay. Yeah. The, the biggest thing for me are the stages are too long and boring. And yes. I don't, there, there's, so back in the day, like this was a huge feat, right? Like the tour, I'm, I'm talking to you, Tour de France. It was a huge feat and people could barely survive this thing. Now cyclists are so good that it is a, still a huge feat to finish the Tour de France, but it's not the same attrition thing that it was, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Mm-hmm. What we need are short stages with lots of action. So uh, two hour stages with lots of hills and climbs and like stuff that would break people up where you go extremely hard the whole time and there's going to be action the whole time. And on these flat stages, just give us like a 20 minute stage. Like, yes, say go 20 minutes and we're going to see the final, what, uh, whatever K that is for 20 minutes, just, uh, happening all at once. You, you'd get huge or make it a 30 minute one or even an hour, right? Uh-huh. Something but that fits into the block. You'd sell less advertising, but you'd get way higher advertising. Uh, you get viewership, better sponsors. Yeah. You'd have higher 
better viewership. So you'd get like, you know, like Gillette versus, I don't know, Maui gin mm -hmm. sunglasses. That was the thing for triathlon. It would always be Maui gin sunglasses for a while. Um, <laughs> A, a brand that has more money that those thing, two things alone. And then with the numbers and then some data and stuff for the other people, uh, you could hype stuff up. That would be so much fun to watch and mm -hmm. it wouldn't be as long as the other stuff, but I think people would get just as tired too, of going all out like VO two max throwing yeah. out the end of stages for two hours, <laughs> then just attrition or it's like five hours of easy riding where they're like talking to each other. They're joking. They're laughing. Like we don't, we want to see competition, not just people hanging out on the bike forever. And then it's it's silly that I can watch literally 60 seconds of a six hour stage and be get all the information that I need to know. Yes. <laughs> I, I crazy. don't understand why they do that. Yeah. I think it's designed for newspaper coverage, not does and for like summaries to be written rather than TV, but they just brought in TV. And yeah, I don't know. I think it's I think it's quite boring really you know to watch like all the stages this happens in software too in products where you start one way and then you keep adding things and you never stop to think well if we were going to do this from the beginning how would we change things how mm -hmm. would we need to make it better and i think they can make it a lot lot better with a lot more action yeah uh even crits Mate. that's it's crits are okay for pro tours you need smaller teams and you need hills because they are so good with aerodynamics and they're so at you know, aerodynamics is exponential yeah. as it goes up that they're going so fast that it's very hard to make separation, uh, inside of that with all, with all the people where it just doesn't end up in a sprint and you don't want, then it's just like a flat stage. But if you have very technical and, uh, lots of, um, yeah, just climbs and like bottlenecks and stuff like that, mm -hmm. that would be mixed cool. in with mixed in with sections of long. If you have like, like, right. Ivy, when you have a crit course where it's just like turn, 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 or like feature, feature, feature the whole way through it just turns into like almost like a single file issue and you can't because there's like a clear fast line and you can't get out of it. If you do, you just fall back. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and it, it makes opens it up. Sorry. Yeah, no, it makes it uh, almost as hard for spectatorship too, as those really long races when people just pass by and you're like, Oh, cool. We'll see you. The race went by, you know, um, when mm -hmm. it's really tight like that and it kind of discourages movement in the race and racing, it's hard for fans to get invested in, want to watch and get excited about it when they just see a string of racers go by in almost the same order every lap. That's a good mm -hmm. point, John, on those long stretches, it should open. They should have some kind of road that's way open where you yep. can go. Everybody can pass. There's no a, other team can come up and I don't know. It's that it could make it a lot better. Personally. I like the climbing stuff, right? Climb, yeah, descent, climb, sure. descent, uh, big climbs, super steep stuff too. Right. Where people are just, I want, want to see them, uh, like pushing their bikes. If you know, if they, if they miss mess something up that sort of stuff too, it's not dangerous. Cause they're going like four miles per hour, but it's so much fun on those stages where you see them like trying as hard as they can and they're going so slow and it's so dramatic. Right. Um, yeah. and have like laps of that. Okay. I, I need to take a break. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good tons of ideas about like balancing the triathlon ideas too. Somebody mentioned the fact that like balancing it out. So it isn't so heavily weighted toward like one uh, split or the other, like right now, if you're a good runner, like in long distance, try boy, you it's like hard to do bad really like, because on the bike, it's so long that it, you can kind of just like hold in at whatever pace if the bike side was a bit more challenging, maybe that could change it around and make it so that athletes have to be a bit more well-rounded. Um, the swim stuff, I think we should all just swim downstream in rivers that are like one foot deep still. So I'm okay with that. <clears throat> and this is like another one. This is a tradition, right? Because the, mm -hmm. the open water swim in what, like Honolulu, where it first started, I forget was the 2.4 mile swim. There was a bike race that was 112, and there was the Honolulu marathon, I believe before yep. they moved to Kona. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but nowadays you could change that. But also if you made them equal time, there would be no age group triathlon. Like if yeah. people had to swim. <laughs> I mean, the amount of people who would do it, if, if you made them equal, say three hours for everything, three hours oh, yeah, of swimming, yeah. like people would, they would die and they would not want to sign up and do it. There would be some crazy people, but the, you know, an hour swim is still extremely hard for the majority of everyone. Let's just move, hour. 
let's just move the water part to the end and make it like a post ride hang. And then, then we're good. Like, you know, just yeah. chill in the water. Right. Ivy. That's your, that's your MO up in the mountains Love in it. Montana. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> sit and then sit in the river. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. The <laughs> one thing that I've seen, they, um, uh, super league triathlon, they do a lot of crazy weird things with format. Like one week you'll do run, bike, swim, swim, bike, run, bike, run, swim. And that will be like the race or they like change up the format and they make it short or a bit longer, really crazy. So they do a lot of interesting stuff. So kudos to them for trying stuff that's different. So, um, let's get into Matt's question. Uh, Matt says, what does your power meter? And I'm going to rely on you a bit on this one, Nate, but what does your power meter calibration number mean? I'm sure this has been covered, but what does the zero offset value correspond to with power meter pedals? And he's saying the Garmin vector three in my case. And in this case, Matt, good news is it's really just power meters in general. Your pedals aren't going to be unique. Mm -hmm. says my understanding is that it should be more or less zero. So why does this, uh, why does the calibration value seem more like a random number generator at times? (laughs) Nothing makes me want to throw my laptop across the room more than having to calibrate 20 times so I can get a zero. And he says, this always seems to happen when I'm pressed for time. And then the final question is negative one or two close enough. Yeah. So this is a great question. And what, what it's doing is it's, you like, you know, use those scales. We have to hit the tar button. And what it does is it takes into account, like nothing's on this system. So whatever it is, air quote, zero it. And this is a good example of what John said before of engineers. So engineers get a reading back from this power meter. And when it's air quote zero, it's like, oh, this is at negative 24 based on what it was at the factory. If they did that with scales, like a, I make um, pour over coffee. So I put 30 grams of coffee in and I have to zero it when I put something on it. And it, it does not make uh, sense for them to say, hey, now it's negative four grams based on what it was from the, from the, from the uh, factory. Some brands do, um, I think Four Eyes does it. They do different numbers of like, it's either good or it's bad. But that's confusing too. I think they use like a one or a zero. And I'm like, you never taught me that one is a, a good or one is a bad. It should be like calibrated or not. Or you could say zero because that makes it like the other scales. Um, and then they're so sensitive that a lot of times too, they'll, you might get negative 435, negative 375. And those to them could be, I'm, I'm not sure, but that could be within one watt or like a half a watt. Pretty much perfectly good. But for me as a consumer, I'm like, that's, you know, 75. Is that a big number or a small number? I don't know. The is units. it bad? Is it good? <laughs> exactly. Right. And you do it where you like zero over and over and over again. And the number changes every time you like yes. on it. These things are very, very sensitive, <laughs> but you don't know uh, as a consumer what's good and what's bad. And where with my coffee scale, I turn it on and it might say, you know, I put a cup on it, it says 230 grams and I push zero and it goes to zero and I go, oh, cool. It's good because mm-hmm. it's zero. And that's what I'm doing to calibrate a scale. Well, not calibrate, but to zero offset. Calibration is different. That's another thing. The The namings of everything are off and they should not call it calibration because that's different in mm-hmm. engineering versus um, consumer stuff. It, so that that's what it is. And I don't know if zero or negative one or two is close enough on the vectors because they're all different. And I don't know if the vectors are actually showing the offset or if it is a... And that's what I talk about the offset is this is what it was. And then based on what we're weighing the system, we're going to st- change where the start of this power curve yes. uh, is or this power linear line. It's, shift, it's shifting the zero point of your power curve effectively. So, um, or the power measurement of that device. If you look at your power meter, like manual, uh, any documentation online, they typically give you figures or a range that is appropriate. And that like, so there can be fluctuation. If one day it says 37 and the next day it says zero, I'm at least in the case of my cork, that's okay. That's not bad. As long as I am just not pressing on the pedals at all, don't have any strain. I'm not leaning the bike over. So the pedals are pressing on something, for example, even on one side, because that will give you a weird calibration value. Just don't want to have anything touching your pedals. You don't want to have your bike like rolling forward and putting strain on the drivetrain or something. In those cases, put your bike there, calibrate it. And temperature shift is like a big thing that you want to keep an eye out for. They're they're supposed to calibrate for temperature because power meters have temperature sensors. And then I believe that they basically just know that if the temperature reads X, then we should shift things by this much. But I think, have we all had issues where using our power meter, we've gone through some sort of weird, big temperature shift, and then the numbers go crazy. I don't, I don't, I 
It's hard to tell because of that, but that used to be a huge, huge issue. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to power media manufacturers, they go, if it's a big temperature change, like being inside and then going outside for your bike, zero. And I go, what about your thermometer? And they go, yeah, still zero. Like you should still yeah. zero. <laughs> and basically, yeah. Yeah. I think too, what that does is it's a, it's a big swing. So you're inside at 70, you go outside and it's 40. That's a big instant yeah. shift. Just do it. But if you're climbing during the day, it's changing. Maybe when you stop, do it. But I wouldn't worry about it during the ride. And I think too, yeah. if it's gradual, it's not as big an issue. But that is probably me just making stuff up. Um, I'm not Speaking sure. of Tahoe Trail 100, I think the last time I did it, uh, Ivy, I did the first lap, super cold. Like it's always really cold in the morning. And the second lap, really hot. And that second lap, I did 60% of the power I did for the first lap, but I was actually faster my second lap than my first lap. Oh. And it was, and that power meter specifically that I had at that time was seeming like it was having a lot of problems with temperature adjustment. So I don't know where that, maybe the temperature adjustment needs some sort of like hole to be able to, you know, get air and get the temperature. I have no clue. And maybe it was clogged. I don't know, but it can happen. So if you have numbers that drift over the course of a ride that coincides with like a big temperature shift, you probably want to check that out. But otherwise look at your power meter manufacturer. It will tell you the range or numbers that are acceptable. And then as long as what I do, my rule is I calibrate and then I calibrate one more time. And if I get the same number twice, then I'm good to go. Then, and that's how I roll. So that's typically, and I do that number. before. Yeah. I do that Close before thing. every single ride. And so. they don't need a hole. Like that'd be pretty, yeah. like think about washing crazy. your bike and stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It'd be crazy. I've and this is something that I have not thought about. It just kind of shows how differing mindsets, uh, can be when it comes to training and equipment, especially last week, was it last week that we talked about equipment and mm -hmm. you know, the gain of investment. My approach is so much just like, this is my equipment. It works. I don't know what this number means, but my power meter is working great. <laughs> my bandwidth to think about what does this number mean? Why is it showing this? Why is it different? I just, I can't, I don't think that way. And if my power meter is working and I'm getting at least somewhat of a consistent read that is close, it doesn't change the effort that I'm doing on the bike. It doesn't change my workout, especially if I'm mm -hmm. able to just get some sort of consistent reading. So my, I, that is not something I thought about. It happened like yesterday. My calibration is usually four or 10 or my offset. And it was like 493. And I was like, mm. and my workout was just the same. So. <laughs> yeah. There you this go. is another example of engineers thinking like engineers and not like the end consumer. Our units should tell us our head units through ant or Bluetooth should say, Hey, this is too big of a change. Like try again, this is invalid calibration. Try again, like something's happened. Contact the yeah. manufacturer. When we're riding and it can detect a temperature change that's too big, we have to calibrate. It could say calibration notice, make sure you calibrate the chain, the, the weather has changed this much. It's there on the thing. Yeah. They haven't thought of like the end use case of what, uh, what we could do inside of there. So we shouldn't have to go online, look up some kind of thing that says, if it's in this kind of range, then you're good. Yeah. Someone just code that into software and tell us yeah, like totally. it's good or it's bad. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go to Ty's question. It says, I like it when you all discuss race strategy stuff. So here's what happened to me last week during a crit. I contested the preem or I contested the preem and I just missed out on winning it. Normally after this, the group takes a, takes a lap to recover and then continues with the race. Mm -hmm. I don't know what sort of crits Ty does, but, um, no way. <laughs> that's attack yeah. time that's attack yeah. time <laughs> yes he said this time however as we were taking a drink a rider launched an attack we had to scramble to chase him and I just couldn't recover from the sprint he kept putting on surges and after and, and after one and a half laps I had to give up as I still hadn't recovered that chase destroyed me I ended up coming last in a small field of nine how do you develop the ability to recover quickly from a sprint so you can chase someone like that I thought that what he did was rude, but I, uh, he says, I thought what he did was rude, but I know it's not illegal. Kind of like attacking in the feed zone, maybe. So yeah, Ivy, Ivy's I want to go to, yeah, I want to go to Ivy first. <laughs> oh, oh baby. That's bike racing. That's not rude. <laughs> that's like, well, you should do anyways. Number one, this is a system that we train. Um, Ty's primary question. How do I develop the ability to recover quickly from a sprint? So you can chase someone like that. That is a physiological thing that we train. And I'll let you two talk about the 
the training aspect of that later, but this scenario is a great example of how we learn to anticipate movement in a race and respond accordingly. Um, this is like Nate said, this is absolutely a predictable move. Um, and that's kind of what anticipatory racing looks like is expecting at every difficult moment, whether it's a preem or a reset after attack, just expecting the most difficult, most horrible outcome that could possibly happen and understanding that it's a possibility and mentally preparing for it. And then the other, the peak of that, um, anticipation in your racing is knowing that it's going to happen and being able to look inwardly and kind of evaluate how many matches you have, if it's worth it to do it all in real time before it happens and when it happens, um, and looking at the full scope of the race. So for Ty, like there's a preem, um, how important is this? Is it worth my whole entire effort in a way that I can't recover and respond to the next moves? And, you know, thinking that that's going to be the last effort of the, of the race is not good anticipation in the race. Um, so it's like looking at the full scope of those, those things and deciding what is worth it. Um, and also deciding how much effort you should put into all of those. So like a preem, no preem should be worth your entire, unless it's some of those crits, like some Midwest crits have crazy, like five or $10,000 preems. If you want to make that it's your crazy. entire race goal and you want to go for it, like absolutely go for broke in that preem effort. But for the rest of the scope of this race, like none of these efforts should be so hard for you that you can't do anything else in the race. Um, we, we get a free pizza in Reno. Oh, but, nice. Yeah. We, we, actually, the we, win. we actually we actually used to get uh water park tickets and i didn't have kids and i was like man who cares about that i would i go? would i would absolutely tear some wheels off to get those water park <laughs> tickets right now like, bucks, right like right sixty dollars yeah. like the more than the winning prize purse or if totally. there is any at all like the preem is worth more i can't i can't remember the last time i actually went for a preem ivy like to your point like certain preems might be worth it and it's easy to just be like, I'm going to go for this premium. That's fun. And that's totally cool. It depends on what your goals are for the race. Um, it can be a great way to like try different things too, I guess, in a race. But yeah, I mean, whenever you go for a premium, it's like just leaving a door open, right? Ivy, like yeah. you should yeah. expect you're going to get I, smacked. I did it at Lamb Park um, before the race. I was like, I'm going to get the first premium to like test my legs and see what's going on, see how people are riding. And I did it and it wasn't about the prize or whatever the mm -hmm. result of the prem was, it was about testing the field and like learning how the race was going to go and testing my legs. So yeah. yeah, Ty needs to gauge their effort. Don't go all in on any effort in the race, either like chasing someone down, responding to a move, um, unless you fully understand that that is your effort and that's what you want to do with the whole entire race. Otherwise you need to anticipate that there will be harder efforts later because there will be. Yeah, well yeah. said. The uh, two for point series, you might be wanting to sprint for premiums for points. And mm -hmm. everything Ivy just said, there could be a very good reason to do it, but you don't want to leave yourself open. Okay, Ty, this is game theory. This is how hard can I go to get this without going so hard that someone else is going to beat me? And they're going to watch you. And if you d go so hard in a sprint that, like, we all, we're all capable of going so hard in a sprint where we have to recover, we have nothing left. Okay, so mm -hmm. there's not an ability to train where you can go as hard as possible and then you can then go harder because it's like it's, that's not it you can get good at sprinting a little bit less like 80 percent or something and, and good at repeatability mm -hmm. and hard mm -hmm. starts and stuff like that but not the ability to do this and it is not rude or oval or uh, it's not rude at all yeah so what happens there's like three ways that i see preems play out one is uh this happens in like a lot of local races like there's three people that go sprint for the preem and kind of like the Peloton lets them go because they know they're going to sprint as hard as they can and they're going to be gassed. And then they kind of like sit up and wait for the Peloton and, and everyone else comes up and they keep going. I've, I've had this strategy with people. And Johnny, he's done this too, where you go, okay, on the second preem, we're going to sprint for it, like the three of us, but we're not going to go all out. We're going to go 80%. And then we're just going to Gut, we're going to just time trial it afterwards as a breakaway. And that I've, you've seen that create a breakaway before, right? Oh, I, yeah. John? Yes. Yeah. It's either one of the, like every, anytime a preem comes up, I instantly, my breakaway radar goes out. Like it's like flashing, right? Like, 
some things because if they're the sort of riders and the composition of the riders going for the preem have the ability to make something stick, then you better not let them get a big gap. You still want them to exhaust themselves, but you do not want to let them get a big gap. But more commonly, I find it's the racers after that are going to counter those that went for the preem that typically end up getting a gap because in some cases, especially if it's a points preem and there's actually something on the line for a preem teams will rally and they will increase the pace and it will go really fast into that preem. So it'll make it really hard. So the entire field will probably be eager for a bit of a rest. That's the perfect time. Like, like flip the tables, Ty, right now you're in a defensive position, but flip the tables and be on the offensive anticipate that the rest of everybody else is going to go for a preem, right? Ivy. I, I, I don't know if that's you're, you're seeming to light up with that. Yeah. And Ty seems like a really strong rider. Like they did well in that sprint. And then it feels like from the description of the race, they were kind of leading the charge on bringing back that mm-hmm. rider from the front. So they're like, or leading the, leading the chase. So it's like, you're, you're a strong rider, Ty. Like next time I challenge you, instead of going for the preem, waiting, falling wheels, sprinting immediately after the preem to get a gap and using that effort, the same effort that you applied to lead the charge in the chase, apply it to a breakaway. And you're not mm-hmm. an asshole for, oh, you're not <laughs> rude. You're not rude for it. Sorry. That's not rude. That's smart. Um, yes. You know, that's smart racing. Um, that's bike racing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, my- let me, I've got more things to say. Please, um, My Sorry. headphones are dying, so you're not going to be able to hear me for a second. <laughs> you're a hot mess today. Dude. <laughs> I'm just going to finish this, and then I'm going to charge in at the moment, and we'll see what happens. Hopefully, you can still hear me talking. So what, we can. In, a, um, in a race, it's, you're going really fast into the, um, uh, into the preem, and you're in the back, and you're in the draft. And we've seen Pete through this a lot. Everyone's sprinting, and then it's a big race, and you see the front start to fan out but you're still going 30 miles per hour. This is where you keep your speed and they're slowing down, slowing down. They're going 20, they're sitting up and you're going to fling right by them and they're going to have to chase you. This is the exact time to do that slingshot. And this is the natural time that you know will happen. And this is probably what the racer did to you. They saw everything Mm -hmm. fan out. Mm There's a slingshot time. The other one that's really cool to do is um, in the preem, you don't, you, you just tuck behind somebody and you're not really sprinting ever in the wind. You're just using that sprint as your own little like launch pad to go do a solo breakaway or there's a couple people and you sit on them. I've done this in crits in California for sure. I know there's going to be a preem. People are starting to sprint around me and I'm already going fast. I can get in their draft. I tuck in as much as I can and they're out of their saddle, right? So you're getting a huge draft and, Uh but you're never trying to go around and you you can save so much power on that. Then when they set up, you're just like, see you later. And you you Uh go and it's, it's amazing. So, um, I'm sure you guys had said this whole time that I'm exactly right. And I've heard, seen some heads <laughs> nods. And I yes, yes. Put one headphone in every other time, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Nate's just making do. He's got like a. He's chain. He's if we're equivalenting this to like flats, Nate's the three flat rider on the group ride right now, and he's just limping through. So, um, <laughs> this is. I feel like this can't be emphasized enough. Uh, in bike racing, you can either pick to say. I'm the victim in this situation. Shoot. Like they, why did they do that? And you could have been the same person that did that to yourself, right? Like it can be you, you just have to be thinking ahead. That's one of the, uh, so Nate, when he first started crit racing, he may have lacked the fitness or the experience, but Nate's very strong in game theory. Um, like he's very good at being able to analyze the situation, see advantage and disadvantage. I remember even like in the beginning, he was, yeah, Nate, you were like questioning the very basics of like, like, but why do teams do this? Why do people do this in a race? It was really good. And that sort of perspective of outside in thinking rather than inside out thinking where you're just like, this is how bike races work. So ergo, this is just what I'm going to do. Instead thinking of it from the outside perspective of how can I just use whatever people are going to do to my advantage in a race and play off that. That's why, that's why I think that you'll see racers like Pete. Pete's mentioned that he's gone into races with a, like a total lack of fitness, but he's still able to manage an okay result. And he does that because he's always thinking one step ahead and he's using whatever you're trying to do in a race for his advantage rather than letting himself fall victim to it. So it's really smart. Really, it's really important stuff to keep in mind. Ivy, do you have anything else to add to this? Nope. 
Keep trying, Ty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, new new role for, for cycling. Whenever I'm tired, nobody can attack. It's great. <laughs> Darn right. Sorry, <laughs> we love you, Ty. Uh, Scott says, hello, trainer. Oh, yeah. And also, I want to, one thing I do want to cover, uh, or two things on the training part. We need to cover that part. But then also, attacking in the feed zone, look, like, uh, that is decidedly rude by people that want to feed in a feed zone. Yeah. Feed That's zone is different, like designated feed areas, different than people just taking a drink in a race. Absolutely. If somebody takes a drink in a race, that is not call a truce. That's, that's their, that's themselves being vulnerable at that time. So, and I've absolutely used that actually to try to get people to attack. Sometimes I can tell somebody wants to attack, but they won't attack and I want them to get tired out. So if I'm just sitting like at an easy pace and I'm marked, I will take a big, long drink and I will make sure that I make myself look totally unarmed and like not ready to be able to do battle, uh, because I want them to attack. It's like a, it's, it's a sign and it's okay to do feed zones. And for those that don't know, and in, in like established races, a feed zone has a start point and an end point that's marketed with a sign it's demarcated. Like it's clear, like here's where it begins. Here's where it ends. Anything on either end of that is absolutely fair game. So that's a, an important thing to keep in mind. I've done a, um, Northern California road race. It was a long road race. And I only, my front camera is covered in mud. I only have my rear camera. We never, I think released this one cause I only had one camera, but I attacked once and someone was eating a bar. I didn't see it cause behind me, but the guy who had the bar dangling in his mouth, trying to chase me down <laughs> and he had his mouth closed. Like it had oh. to make it, make it harder. Good for him. He didn't litter. Um, but yeah, he was able to do it and, and he, I still didn't even drop him. That was annoying. Yeah. But <laughs> I want to say two more things too in gravel and mountain bike. When there's a feed zone, there's no requirement that people have to wait for you, that they have to feed, that they have totally. to go a certain speed. They can blow right through that thing. There's no like, yes. Hey everybody, now we have to go this. And if also like, if you're in a Peloton, you're like, Hey, everyone, I have to pee. So therefore everyone has to pee. And someone goes, I don't want to pee. I'm just going to keep going. They can keep That's going. Okay. Like, yeah, it's not, it's not like you should learn how to pee on the bike or you should have drank less. There's yeah. yeah. Because you want something doesn't mean that some other people have to do it that same way. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well said on the training side of things, Ty, this is a, the crit plan is your answer. It's going to work on repeatability. It's going to have you doing things like reduced amplitude billets. Uh, what we talk about was so that's the spot where you might have a VO two set, a set of VO two work. And that set will be like seven minutes long, which seems crazy to do VO two work for seven minutes. But throughout that seven minutes, you'll be 20 seconds in VO two. And then you'll be doing 15 seconds. at something like, uh, threshold, maybe high sweet spot. And those will just repeat for seven minutes. In the end, you end up hitting peak aerobic uptake and accomplishing that for sure. And it's really tough, but that sort of work is what you'll work your way toward in a crit plan. Uh, repeatability is a big focus and you, that's absolutely something that's trainable. And that's absolutely something that as if crit racing is your focus, you should be targeting. Um, that's one, one of the things that Ivy is really good at. That's why she's so good at cross and crits and all that other stuff. So she spent Thanks. years working on that. <laughs> yeah, still so, am. It's not it's gonna, never over. It's going to come in, in, in handy up on uh, the long, steady drags of Tahoe Trail 100, eh, Ivy? Yeah, I'm totally prepared. it <laughs> <laughs> will be good. Okay, uh, let's go into Scott's question. More, uh, once again, kind of like a training power metrics question. Uh, hopefully it's informative for y'all says, hello, trainer road team. You are the best. And I appreciate all you have, or I appreciate you all. You've made me faster, happier, and smarter. It's good to hear Scott. That's what we're here for. I'm preparing for the talk. Oh, and by the way, uh, Scott left somewhat of a review there and you can review us on Spotify. You can review us on iTunes and you can review the trainer road app on the app store. Please do that. Or the Google play store. Uh, please do that. That would be fantastic and really helpful. So if you appreciate anything that you get from the podcast, go and leave us a five-star review. We would love that. Uh, Scott says I'm preparing for the Tahoe trail 100. Hey, there we go. And I'm planning to, to rely fairly heavily on my intensity factor for pacing purposes. Nate, can you uh, describe really quickly what intensity factor is as like a just basic point? Yeah. So it is the, uh, the, you take your normalized power and divide it by your FTP. And that gives you like, um, a percentage number. And we, we don't view it as percentage. So if you had your normalized power be exactly your IF it would be 1.0. And if you did half of your normalized power for your FTP over a given time, that would be uh, 5.50 
or 0.5. Yeah. And we don't, it doesn't have to take anything to do in time into account. So a IF of uh, one for 10 minutes is a much different effort than an IF of one for an hour, mm -hmm. but you'll still have that same IF of one. So for certain races and for like triathlon and stuff, you might have a target IF and it really, I think we're going to get into this, but it really works well for um, steady stuff mm -hmm. uh, and it, where it gets really up and down, especially with mountain biking, where your normalized power is going to probably going to be way lower than normal. That's like a mountain biking thing. Um, mm -hmm. It isn't the best metric to use for pacing like at all, especially at Tahoe Trail, which I don't know if we're taking the elevation into account, but. Yeah, it's, it's which we'll get to that. Um, I think that, and I think that if anything, though, that course is one of the better mountain biking courses to work uh, with IF. Uh, Leadville is pretty darn good too. The only spot where you really coast on Leadville is like Columbine coming down. So other than that, you're kind of just on the gas and it's more or less steady, except just for that darn down power line. line. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's true. Power like, line you coast too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of coasting, um, but yeah. No brakes on power line. Brakes, brakes just slow you down. Who needs them? Um, okay, so says when riding outdoors, I have made a point of tracking my IF and have de IF and have developed a sense for what I can handle over various periods. For Tahoe Trail 100, I'm planning to target an IF of 0.85. So that's roughly 85% of their FTP. So in this case, if you keep that, that's pretty sustainable. If you're going to do something like a three-hour effort up to maybe a four-hour effort. Um, you'll see like the best Ironman triathletes pushing between, you know, around like 0 0.8 to 0 0.85, the very, very best ones that can do that, but then they still somehow run. Yeah. Exactly. Which is so crazy. It's that's doable. 0 0.85 for three hours. Doable. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's the sort of thing that will feel easy in the beginning and then really hurt at the end. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, uh, mentions that, uh, in this case, uh, Scott mentions, I have a Garmin 830 and a cork power meter. My question relates to an inconsistency I have observed and how my setup factors into sense, i.e. periods of zero output when calculating my IF specifically, I've observed that my setup doesn't appear to factor in periods of zero power output. For example, if I climb 10 minutes at an IF of 1.0, then descend for two minutes with zero power output, one would expect to have an IF of 0.8. However, in this situation, my setup would continue to report an IF of 1.0. In other words, it appears that my setup only records output for the purposes of calculating IF when my output is greater than zero. So does this make sense? And is this unique to a head unit power meter combo, or do I fundamentally misunderstand how IF is calculated? We'll get to that, or let's cover that one. And then yeah. there's a question about pacing. So uh, head units have this thing that says include zeros or in the calculations and average power. And this is the silliest thing. It should always be there, but there's yes. an option. Someone goes, I want really high average power. So don't include zeros. Zeros are your coasting. It should not be an option anywhere. It's just turn it off. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can't even think of a, a good way to like a good analogy. It's silly. I'll think of one totally talk and interrupt you. Yeah, that's probably the <laughs> that's probably the setting that they have enabled in this case because normalized power should be non there should be something that's going to be factoring this in appropriately. Um, this is like a way that some people do to get really high average power because like you know anytime you coast it just ignores that and then factors it in. Um, but that's you know physiologically speaking, another way to think about this is let's say you rode at your FTP and you did it for thirty minutes and then you took like a three hour break and you ate and you recovered and then you went and did it again, but your rear bike wasn't moving the whole time in between then, it would say that you just did an hour at your FTP and that would be like truly impressive, but really you had a giant break in between, right? So if you're doing something that doesn't include zeros, that would, that would I guess, uh, kind of disproportionately inflate that effort and it make it seem like you did something that really isn't reflective of reality. So. Yeah. Uh, now the other question, I have an FTP of 265 at sea level, given the Tahoe trail 100s altitude, what should I discount my FTP to in order to ensure the 0.85 IF target still makes sense. And I got some notes in there for you, Nate, on this one. No, you can read it though. Cool. You, you yeah. yeah. So average, average elevation is 2000 meters or 6,500 feet for that race. That's average. You'll be going up and down from, from there. So with that in mind, you should reduce your FTP by about 12%. And that gets you a 232 watt FTP, which I think puts your IF around 187, somewhere around there. And that's a bit problematic though, right, Nate? Because in some cases, you will not be able to hold 187 watts on that course. It's just too steep. It depends on your weight. 
but especially yeah, that true. first climb outside of the uh going up the steep ski slope area yes yeah there's just no way so in that case remember that this is an average so you'll let yourself go above it in certain spots but you'll try to minimize that time when you go above it but i think the key to going fast on courses especially this course is to minimize your time below it too try to stick really close to it and just like just like in a workout uh, you don't want to drag an average up and down in a workout your focus is every second of that workout just be as close to your target as possible right instead of trying to drag things up and down and in this case for a race i think it's really important as well to try to just spend every second that you can as close to that as possible that's going to give you the most even pacing what i like to do on these kinds of these long uh endurance um, either road or, or, you know, Grand Fondo gravel rides, or as I, ha I have a target pace power on climbs and I have a target power on flats. And so on the climbs, it's usually a sweet spot effort almost every single time. And I try to make sure I never go over sweet spot. There are times and you will, but you're going to be conservative so that, you know, at the, the last climb, if you're feeling great, you can climb at a threshold, but the opposite is so bad. And this is a good strategy <laughs> for, we talked about Leadville, pretty much every race. There's my governor on this portion and there's this, I wouldn't be trying to chase a normalized power during the ride. That's going to be extremely hard. Um, that's not a good pacing strategy at all. And I wouldn't even actually care about the IF on this course at all. I would just go, the climbs are about this long. You can look on Strava. This is what I can do for that length. This is how many repeats it's going to be. So that's going to be sweet spot. And then I can do endurance in between at kind of this much power. You're probably good to go. Yeah. And pre-ride with Jonathan and Ivy. <laughs> That's it, on, Scott. On come join July us 8th. tomorrow. And then you can try that strategy. That's honestly a really good point. And that's one of the things I'm looking forward to doing on the course tomorrow is just in certain sections to be like, okay, what's my power like here? And what sort of like speed am I going? What sort of pace? How does this feel in relation to what I think I could sustain all day? That sort of stuff. It's not going to be a, a hard pace. We'll be going easy, but in certain sections, you'll just be able to feel that out. So certain I, I sections think being the first two hours. Yeah. <laughs> AKA first lap. Um, but yeah. I, I think the, uh, for me, I do really value IF for my pacing mate in these sort of scenarios, because I found that if I let myself and I do like the idea of bracketing, making sure that you're staying still within sweet spot on the climbs, but it's, uh, for some people, I want to make sure that you're hearing Nate correctly, that he's talking about, he isn't letting himself just go hog wild in the climbs and then has like, a goal that he holds for the flats, it's still constrained. He's still got limits uh, that he'll try to hold to and try to stay within on those climbs. So I see a lot of athletes just like let themselves go wild. And there's a few spots on this course where goodness, it can cook you, uh, because it can, it's just steady power, not descending up, descending up all day. Instead it's, there's a lot of steady power. And if you push yourself too hard, then you just bleed time in those long fire road sections that you could be gaining a lot of time on other people. So, and unless it's a steady thing, a steady race, I really don't like IF. This is why we did workout levels too, is that we found that intensity factor did not correlate with failure rates for workouts mm -hmm. because it's, um, it, and there's the, like the downtime, the warm up and the cool down, then we do something like clip those off to look at, uh, the hard part too. It's the way you put out the power has way more to do than the ending normalized power related to your average yeah. power. Now it's, it can be too a good like oh wow this is way too high because there's no chance where if it goes high like it's always going to be hard if it's too high but if it's too low at the beginning something i i don't know maybe after the fact i, I don't i'm trying to figure out john so how do you use if like on your yeah. head unit as you're riding tahoe i think you just made a key point it's like the pacing that i do i'm i'm i know that the joke is that i always go out too hard and and this race i'll also go out very hard um, it's also a fact, not just a joke. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I'll go out hard on this one too, because you kind of have to, like Nate mentioned last time, if you get stuck behind some, everyone goes really hard up this first climb. If you get stuck behind them, you get into single track and you lose a lot of time. So it'll start hard, but the way that I race on these sort of races is very stable power. And I've learned that over time to be like very good at holding stable power. And as a result, IF becomes a lot more relevant for me to just kind of keep an idea. Now I don't, I admittedly don't watch IF. I just watch my normalized power and I know where my normalized power it needs to be. And really in that case, it's just looking at two different, or one thing, two different ways, your normalized power, or your IF. So I just look at my NP. And in this case, 
I'm going to be pushing for somewhere between on my lap. I'm going to be pushing for like 0.9, uh, to try to, cause it's just going to be one lap. So two hours, I'm going to, that would be really tough. If I could do up at elevation like that 0.9, I'd be really proud. Um, so I'm going to push and claw my way through that. That's my goal. Please so, tell us if you do that. I'm going to try my best. The tell There's really not a, not a lot of descending. So I don't have any power for Tower Trail 100. So on your bike, you won't. Yep. So how are you going to pace it then Ivy in, the, in that case? Cause that's a really common scenario for a lot of folks here. Right. I have no idea. We got a pre-ride. <laughs> <laughs> this is why pre-ride is so important, right? Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And I mean, RPE, like, sure, it will change as time goes on, but as long as you just know that at the end, it's going to hurt a whole lot worse and you're just going to have to push through that, then I guess you'll, you're in a good spot, you know? Well, yeah, it's where like the years of RPE training are going to really come in handy for me when we pre-ride to understand like, okay, where is this climber, this feature in proximity to the rest of the course and knowing myself super well and knowing this is how hard I can go to make mm-hmm. sure that I still have some in the tank left for this later. Um, so pre-riding will be super key in that regard. Yeah. Nate, I wish you were doing this. It'd be fun. Yeah. You can hang Which, You can feed us water bottles. Like, by water, the way, yeah. see you later. <laughs> <laughs> juniors, juniors, um, took my, one of my coveted KOMs last night at a short track race. And I was real sad about it. And then I looked at the KOM list and Nate, you were two seconds behind me on the KOM. And my mind was just like exploding. And I was like, when did Nate, cause I did 400 and like almost, almost 490 Watts for an hour or for a minute and 48 seconds on this climb that's up at 8,000 feet. Much power. Yeah. And, <laughs> and for my weight, like that's like a really hard, good effort. I was real proud of that. And you were two seconds behind me and that's I couldn't figure it. it out. It's at sky tavern. And then I remembered Nate was on your, you were on your e-bike. Oh, your e-bike. Was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't mark it as an e-bike ride. Please don't mark it as an e-bike ride either. Keep it up. It's good. So, um, yeah, I know. Right. Uh, Jack says, Hey team, big fan of the podcast and bigger fan of the TR platform. I mean, that's okay, but I don't want you to play favorites, Jack. Why don't you just love the whole thing evenly? Uh, it says I've even managed to get my wife signed up. So we're now officially a trainer road family. A lot of talk on the podcast and the forum is focused on FTP as Watt KG, but as a cough heavier writer, realistically, I'm never going to be very strong by that metric. However, I feel like I have the potential to have a relatively high pure Watts FTP number. So to my question, how much does Watt KG actually matter on flat TT races? If I only target such races, does it matter if I carry heavy muscle on my upper body? Cheers. No, to uh, Jack, here's the key. This is what people do. If you are a light rider, you talk about Watt KG. If you're a heavy rider, you always just say Watt, say FTP. You're like, <laughs> like you hear Pete, you're like 400. Like he never talks about the weight size. You're just like, oh my goodness, 400. And he's like, that, that's 4.1 watts per kilo or something. And it's, uh, yeah. yeah, just say it that way. So anyways, go for it, John. You got a whole bunch of stuff right now here. Yeah. I've kind of got a whole scenario. And, and actually, before I do this though, Ivy, this is a realization that you came to in your career, right? Where you were just like, I'm, uh. I need to just focus on my output rather than focusing too much on the weight. Yeah. I mean, it happened on the South river ride on Tuesday when, uh, I felt like, um, that's a super hard race ride in Sacramento and, um, wind plays a huge, very, very, yeah, it, it's a big part of the outcome of the race and sorry, race ride. (laughs) And I have to come to terms with this watts per kg thing all the time because watts per kg i'm a pretty good rider but in a scenario where it's a super fast tailwind um my watts per kg don't matter and it's just kind of like a watts thing just like a pure watts thing and it is so tricky for me and that usually is the point um near the end of it where i get spit off so yeah it's still something that i have to address and come to terms with all the time for sure i built up a uh, uh, fictional scenarios, but they're, it's using best bike split to figure out the data. So I, I am confident that the data is good. Uh, so I've built up an athlete that has a 300 watt FTP and there's two different scenarios. The either way, 175 pounds, uh, which is, I think it's 91 or 90. Oh man. I messed up the number there. Can somebody check how many kilograms 175 pounds is? So they're either 170 pounds, 75 pounds, or 200 pounds. So that's a, as we're looking at 25 pound difference, um, I think we're probably looking at like 80 something kilograms versus 90 kilograms. Yeah, 79. Yeah. 
79 versus 80 kilo or versus 90 kilograms. Yep. So, uh, they're on a TT bike and they're holding an arrow position. Okay. So with that, and we're going to look at the difference here between this 175 pound rider or 200 pound rider in a flat. And these are all 40 K TT routes. So 40 K is the distance. Uh, if you did a truly flat one where you only gained 26 feet of elevation or 7.9 meters over the 40 K, the difference is 0.64% slower by having more weight on you. So if wind comes into play and you're dealing with that, I bet that Wait, you would actually be faster. So, so is that a percent say like time? Cause I don't know. Percent. Yeah, absolutely. 56 minutes and 35 seconds is the time that you would have if you weighed 175 pounds. But if you weighed 200 pounds, you'd have 56 minutes and 57 seconds. So, so you're roughly seconds. looking 22 seconds. Yep. So you'd be 22 seconds slower carrying extra weight. But once again, right, Nate, if it was like a windy day, I bet the athlete that is going to be, I mean, I guess if they have the same threshold, it's probably no different, so but the, the difference yeah. is probably going to be your coefficient drag is going to be a little bit bigger. If you're heavier, normally upper body weight, you're like, your, your yeah. size is bigger. Cause I don't, I don't know. We have this inside of here, but weight itself, if you go yeah. from body comp change where the, your frontal area does not change at all. It's not going to make a difference at all. Even with the wind, it's not going to make a difference. You're just denser unless you, you might get pushed uh, around less. Yeah. One flaw in this whole scenario is chances are, if you just like gain 25 pounds, uh, you're probably also going to raise your FTP to some degree, right? Um, in most cases when the athletes are training. So that's a, that's, we're just looking at a hypothetical scenario here where there is no difference in power output. That's just is what it is. So flat 40 KTT, you'd have, you'd be 22 seconds slower. Uh, and that's over 50, nearly 57 minutes. That's not really a massive difference that you would see now over a rolling 40 K course where you'd climb 696 feet or 212 meters over that 40 K. Uh, you, if you weighed 175 pounds, you'd be 56 minutes and 17 seconds. <clears throat> if you weighed 200 pounds, 57 minutes and 12 seconds. So that's 1.6% slower. And so that's where the effect starts to get, starts to ramp up a little bit. If you're doing a climbing race where it's once again, minute, sorry, just so people know. It's yeah. Thanks. Mate. Slower. Yeah. Yep. If you're doing a climbing race where 40 K T T once again, but you climb 1,655 feet or 504 meters. These are just specific courses, hence the specific numbers. <laughs> uh, in that case, you'd be 3.5% slower. So you can see how it's ramping up. Uh, and when you look at this, it's a whole lot closer. You're like three minutes uh, slower in this case, right, Nate? No, a little over two minutes, two minutes and 20-ish seconds. Thanks for doing math for me. And then, and let's just add a ridiculous extreme hill climb scenario. So let's say you climbed 9,000 feet over 40 KTT. And I used like the uh, section of, of, um, of Mount Ikea to figure this one out. If that's the case, then you'd be 11.7% slower. So, and that's the difference three hours and 11 minutes versus three hours and 36 minutes. So that's About quite a 20. lot. We're, yep. Yeah. That's quite a lot. Now, how realistic is that last scenario? Super unrealistic. Like you're probably not going to come across where you in 20 something miles, 24 miles, you climb 9,000 feet. Uh, but just the same, uh, to illustrate it, that's what it is. So to answer your question directly in a flat 40 KTT scenario, you're looking at just 20 seconds, 0.64% slower is what you would have. But once again, if you're really adding weight on, you're probably going to be raising your FTP or going the other way. A lot of athletes feel pressured. We all do to lose weight all the time. And to, man, what if I just kept my FTP, but I dropped my weight and that's the temptation. And it's really hard to keep your FTP and drop your weight in a lot of cases, not all, but in a lot of cases, it can be difficult. Uh, usually drop in weight coincides with some sort of drop in FTP increase in weight coincides with some sort of increase. As long as you're talking productive muscle, you know, it depends where you're starting and what your, uh, body comp is because we have so many ones. I, I think I've had it too here, right? Like lose 20 pounds and gain 30 Watts. That happens all the time. But if you're already been training for a long time and you're kind of at your set point and it's a, you know, your body comp is, is, is in a, a healthy range, then it's really hard what John said. But if you're starting, you know, with, with stuff to lose, you can totally lose weight and gain FTP. But Jack, it sounds like you're just a big person with a lot of muscle. So in order for you to lose weight, you're gonna have to lose muscle. And this is that, that scenario where John said is that for you, the extra 25 pounds or whatever in this situation, I would, I would bet so much money that you're gonna have a higher FTP and you're gonna end up racing faster on a flat 40 KTT.
Totally. And you can do things like sag climb or uh, any number of different things, right? Ivy to be able races. to like Just minimize your losses in climbs and stuff. Yeah. And from a performance standpoint, these metrics and numbers don't speak to your mental state going into a race, how you feel prepared in this specific zone or system versus someone that has an equitable FTP that hasn't trained or prepared for a 40 K in the way that you have, like, this is just one part of a very big scope of things that will go into your performance in a 40 K TT. So don't stress out about it too much. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Last question from Ed this Hey train road crew, five-star podcast. And one of the only things that gets me through a 90 minute threshold workout. So there's a dual effect. Good to hear Ed and five stars talking about reviews. Once again, please leave them on for the podcast. It says I've just returned from completing the Maratona de los Dolomites. Although the five day trip was overall a wonderful experience. My performance on the day was disappointing. It sounded a lot like what happened to, the, to this coach Chaz chap that wrote in last week, <laughs> yeah, whoever that was, uh, all was well until the bottom of the Giao when it was like someone switched off the power. Somehow I got to the summit where I unceremoniously emptied my stomach. Oh, I felt terrible. And the rest of the ride was simply a survival effort with 180 Watts feeling like 380. I rolled in some way behind the rest of the group. I was hoping to finish with it was later diagnosed by medical professionals as heat stroke. It's been really hot this year in Northern Italy. The cause I think is now well understood and I accept the learnings from that. But what concerns me is the sense of disappointment. All that work and anticipation for an event that I may never get the chance to do again feels wasted. And I feel I didn't give a fair account of myself. It's impacted my motivation to train and even the amazing memories I have are shrouded in a dull mist of disappointment. How do you guys deal with disappointment, particularly really important A events that you can't just go back the next week and right the wrongs? I'm acutely aware of training or that my training had nothing to do with the performance on the day. So I'm not going down that well-trodden route of wanting to change everything. Well, uh, very smart and astute, good, good analysis there. But right now I just feel uh, deflated and unmotivated to start another block of training. Nate, I wanted uh, to share, uh, I wanted to have you share this one. I don't know if, uh, why? <laughs> Cause I would keep Epic. Um, I don't want to, I don't, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bolts, all that stuff. Um, I don't know if the circumstances are the same for you, but have you experienced this thing and how have you dealt with it? Yeah. I like carry it and it's tough to sleep every night. And like, <laughs> no. what, what you do, there's two parts to this. One Ed is, you know, enjoying the process of training is very important because if it's all of like how I can put this out on this certain day, if you don't get a good result on that day, then you can get in this spiral and it can be very hard to do things, um, hard to train and move forward. The other part is there's so many things in life that you don't realize that you're grateful for until you're pretty far away. And there, there are things that like, you can think back of a hard time in your life where in the moment you're like, this is horrible. I don't want it to happen. And this is something where you know, John, you might say you never want your son, Simon, to go through this, but you yourself are grateful for that experience because it made you who you are and you mm -hmm. learn something very specific about that in the future. Um, and this case, Ed, right now, you might be able to take this and you might learn something at a truly now important part where maybe, you know, to be dramatic, could be something your life could depend on in the future that you don't get heat stroke or you prevent someone else from getting heat stroke. And this only happened because you had this experience at this race and in the future you'll come back and you'll say i am so glad i had that experience this is so i'm so grateful for it and you can't you don't know it until it happens in the future i remember too i got man i, I did like an investment way back in the day when i was an engineer and somebody you know talked up and i did six thousand dollars and i was like so much money and i was like depressed lost that money that person i'm so thankful because people at the beginning of trainer road tried to do things and like talk me into stuff and I saw the same patterns for that $6,000 that I paid back then, which was low stakes compared to trainer road. And I was able to identify it and say, no, those are those bad patterns of that, that thing that I was so bad about and depressed and like, wow, I can't believe I got took for that money. Now I'm like, so grateful that saved me so much money. I am so glad that happened. Like that is the best, you know, not one of the best things out of my life, but I'm grateful for that experience at the time was a negative. And if you can think about that, that you know, it's going to be, it's going to be okay. And you're going to learn from this. Then it's like, awesome. Um, 
same thing with Cape Epic 40k TT 40k TT you know how many people I told about bolts like there's got to be at least one crash I prevented right of like something horrible um, uh, and, and, two, scum. and then in the future too I I you know I don't know what the negative would have been but boy did I triple quadruple check uh torque specs in because that was my issue is the torque spec on this thing for those who don't know was 24 newton meters or something and i set it to six newton meters like every other bike part uh and now i double check everything right like uh do i do it i hope everyone else does too so um that's that's what i do ed ivy i have a slightly different approach nate so um i found that when i would apply that approach of um this will feel rewarding later, or there will be some sort of good outcome from this later. I will understand in the future why this moment was significant, even though it feels like shit right now. Um, that was a really dangerous approach for me because it still made me sit in letting myself be disappointed with it right then in that moment. And so emo Ivy is entering the chat. Everything <laughs> is disappointing. Like every scenario, even for, for, Ed, even if they didn't bomb it at the top of this climb and have heat stroke and horrible time, what if everything went right? You could still apply some sort of dis level of disappointment if you didn't climb the way you wanted to, if you didn't perform the way you wanted to. It's so easy to like slip into this mindset of um, this is disappointing for some reason. It didn't go perfectly. I'm going to find out later why this was valuable. And for me, that was kind of... Um, I would just wallow in it and the wait and like look for this good outcome later. And as a result, I didn't, I miss a lot of the positive outcomes that were like there right in front of me immediately for Ed. I don't know if there was some sort of, you still get to be in Italy. I don't know, but that's why my approach is a little bit different. And I try to not let my, try to really force myself and work to find some sort of immediate positive outcome to prevent myself from going into that mindset and then waiting for the lesson later on. Hmm. That, uh, I, I think that I, the way that Nate said one thing that really resonates with me is how I get through tough and difficult uh, things with cycling and training and everything else with the results is I have had to learn to enjoy the process of training and improvement process of setting a goal and then working toward that. And then I've really kind of detached from what that outcome of the goal will be. And instead just really focused on the work, the goal is my North star and I work hard to achieve it. And when I achieve it, that's awesome. Uh, but what I'm most proud of is the work to it that I've done to get there. And that doesn't change if the outcome is bad. I'm, and if I look back, I'm proud of what the, of the good things I did and of the bad things, that's just more stuff to go toward later. But unlike, uh, I try to pick those things up constantly and I try to pick up the good and keep it with me every single step of the way along, you know, like when I do that workout, I think nailed that workout. Great job. You slept really well at that night before you, you decided to avoid distraction and you were able to just sleep and get up. You fed yourself and, and nourished yourself really well. Great job. And those little things that I pick up along the way, it's all the process of training that makes it so that when I get there to the race, it allows me to just race freely. And like, like Amber says, approach it with curiosity. I show up and I give it everything. And if something crazy like that happens, then I go, man, that sucks. All right. You know, and I, I'm able to move on because I'm satisfied with all the things that I did leading up to that, you know, in, in retrospect, and this sounds like, like perhaps like obvious, uh, but really it is important. Don't let like, if you look at it just in time allocation, look at all the time that you allocated wisely and effectively and well toward this moment. And then look at the time that was spent in that bad state and it pales in comparison. It's a small amount. So you did a lot of good and instead just look at that good and then take it forward. And I completely agree with Nate's perspective too, on the, now the learnings get to serve you. You have more experience that you get to use. It's good stuff. So yeah, three different perspectives on what we do. I like it. Uh, two, it could not be hot heat stroke. It, it kind of sounds just like bonking in terms of this and well, then this is diagnosed to... he said by medical professionals in this case so mm. yeah how do you diagnose heat stroke hours after the fact when you're at a who knows yeah who knows i don't think if he had heat stroke it'd be really hard to finish a whole right like to ride all that time there's heat exhaustion which can be different than heat stroke right yeah 
heat stroke is technically, uh, usually something that stops people, but Hey, I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to delve into that, but Nate, you, 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 <laughs> you bring up a good point though. Cause I bet there are people listening to this and you might assimilate your own experience with this, right? With dehydration. And yeah. There's a lot of different steps that probably lead to that scenario, that outcome. So yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks guys. Thanks y'all. I appreciate you both. This could have been a good episode. If you're listening to this and you've appreciated it, go rate the podcast, rate Trainer Road, and you should go and sign up for Trainer Road. Give it a chance to make you faster for whatever goal events you have, and it will. It's good, exciting stuff. Adaptive training is amazing. AI FTP detection, and we have a ton of great things that we're working on here to all to make you faster. So go sign up for Trainer Road and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have some awesome content coming your way real soon on how to get faster. Uh, that's it for this week. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.